Dr. Uh, Dick Hubman is from the University of South Carolina, where he is the Dean of the School of Medicine. It's a distinct honor to have him here. He started the first ultrasound curriculum uh, down there at the University of South Carolina, and uh, he's, he's here today to talk about how to, to, uh, to fund this, navigating some of the financial waters here of academia, something I struggle with, we all struggle with, obviously, but when I applied for my grant, um, we're, you know, we're, all, we're all a tribe in this, in this ultrasound world. When I applied for, for my grant uh, the first time around, they didn't know anything about this. This foundation had no idea what ultrasound meant. You know, medical education, ultrasound integrated medical education didn't make any sense to them. But they were a little intrigued, and they did their homework. They sought out uh, Dr. Hupman, and he spent quite a bit of time with them explaining what they did at University of South Carolina and the importance of it, and basically vetting ultrasound in medical education. For me, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know they were. This was all going on in the background, and then that's how I got funded. So I owe a huge debt of gratitude uh, to him not only for all the in innovative pioneering work that the University of South Carolina has done with ultrasound medical education, but also helped me secure that grant. So no better person to talk about that than uh, <laughs> Dr. Hubman right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Uh, certainly a pleasure to be here and talk about uh, navigating these waters. Um, I do want to thank AIUM. Uh, you know, this forum was really a brainchild of Dr. Goldstein, um, and this is exactly what I think we really need uh, to share what we've learned and, and to move forward. And it's become a reality by the wonderful people at the uh, AIUM and putting this together. Um, so we're going to talk about the um, navigating the financial waters, and the stuff you've heard this morning is a nice lead-in, really, because um, I can go through the first part of this rather quickly. Um, I don't know if you know Winslow Homer or not. Um, was an American uh, painter, uh, born in Boston, uh, worked mostly uh, in the Northeast, but uh, marine topics, uh, marine subjects was a big part of his uh, um, artistry, so uh, I've included a couple of them in there. Uh, so the real question is, um, how much money uh, will an ultrasound program cost? And so you do need to have some sense of that uh, because you're going to be asked, so you have to have some sense of uh, what it's ultimately going to cost. So what are the factors that affect the cost? And many of you are running into these already. Class size is certainly an issue in your curricular design that you have. You know, with class size, we have 100. Um, I know some schools run around 200. There's some schools actually over 300 students per class. Uh, so obviously that's going to be a factor in terms of what it's going to cost. Um, the number of ultrasound systems you need, uh, instructor time, uh, scanning laboratory stretchers, uh, monitors, supplies, uh, standardized patients. Certainly students can scan each other, but you're also going to need some standardized patients. Uh, if you want to expand the program with simulators and phantoms, if you're going to have an image portal for review, which is really going to be important for competency-based medical education and then faculty development because we all have to get more faculty who can teach this and then curricular content and it would be nice if you had an administrator learning management system in e-portfolio so it can be a lot of money one of the things to keep in mind is we're just finished year number nine so we've been at this for nine years um, so we've sort of built ours over time so some general recommendations um, form a small multidisciplinary uh, disciplinary, uh, team with expertise in ultrasound and education and get representation within the Office of Medical Education. Really, really important to try to do that early on to get those folks on board. I know and when I was the dean, I was associate dean and dean for 15 years, when the folks come to me and they had sort of bypassed the education people, um, it usually didn't go as well. So get, get those folks on board and get a sense of what it is that you, you um, uh, want to propose to the dean when you go see the dean. Um, identify um, champions uh, across all basic and clinical sciences, and that's also potential champions, folks who you think may be interested, students like them, they're innovative, they like to do those things. Um, Turn to experience uh, sources, AIUM and SUSB, and you heard a nice overview of uh, the tools and other things that are available for you. Uh, visit existing programs, such as the wonderful program right here uh, at Irvine create an inventory of what you already have. So the first thing you do is you take that first sheet and make a spreadsheet out of it. Uh, what's going to be all the components to this? Um, and then what I need to do is what do I already have in-house? Um, uh, what can I share uh, with departments, with Sim Center, et cetera? So you've got a nice big picture in terms of what you need, what you already have in-house. 
Start small, really important to start small, and don't ask for too much uh, to begin with. What you want is to plan some early successes, and the early successes will come with uh, students really liking the program and wanting more. Uh, and so you can move forward from there, and you build a program over time. So we made the decision when we started, we would have a little bit of ultrasound in every year and add a little bit every year, and that's pretty much what we've done. So you got to have a pitch, um, and I would suggest that you put bullet points together in an elevator talk. You know, that 30-second talk uh, that uh, when the opportunity arises, you want to make your pitch. Uh, so actually have that, and that's really important because you want consistency with your team in terms of we're all on the same page of why we're doing this and how we're going to end up moving forward. You'll also have last-minute requests from um, uh, writers and newspapers and magazines wanting to know a little bit about your program. So if you sort of have that outlined in ready to go. Um, it'll be more consistent uh, and you, you'll be able to give them the sort of information that you want to give them. And there's going to be fortuitous opportunities with potential donors, VIPs, etc. So you want to have those ready uh, uh, to, to move with. Uh, same thing is true with the opportunity for executives, politicians, etc. Um, you want to document events, and I'm going to show you a number of pictures. Capture pictures, capture stories. It's pictures and stories that really sell people. Um, and so uh, students uh, doing ultrasound and happy, and students being involved in projects, and stories of uh, wonderful outcomes with ultrasound, and students being involved in that. Um, keep those. I can't tell you the number of times you'll have something to go really well and say, man, I wish we had captured a video with some pictures from that. And you heard a, a number of these this morning. I think you really need to have these outlined for folks as well. Uh, these are some of the reasons for incorporating ultrasound. We've heard a lot about, you know, active learning, basic clinical sciences, curricular tool. Um, one of the things that's really, really important, and I try to drive home, is that if we want to make this a core curriculum, there has to be applicability across almost every specialty and subspecialty, and it is. Um, and so people still think in terms of OB, radiology, cardiology, but it's much, much broader than that. People need to understand we're talking about family medicine, internal medicine, surgery, uh, neurology, uh, across the board. So no matter what your student is trained in, they're going to have applications for ultrasound. So no, it's not a waste of time for those students. Um, Student satisfaction is high, um, almost all established programs, and everywhere you look in the literature, students absolutely love ultrasound. It's ideal for competency-based uh, education, and there's no question that's going to be the education model for at least the next 10 years, and uh, ultrasound fits in so nicely uh, to that model. You can provide early and uh, longitudinal clinical experience. Another thing that lots of folks are doing now, they talk about longitudinal curriculum. Can raise the profile of the institution. It's an advantage for recruiting students and residents. You've heard a little bit about that this morning with the increase in terms of applications. Um, and likely to be an advantage in the residency match, which I think is going to be huge. So we started collecting a little bit of data on this. Uh, 2010 was the first year uh, the graduates had ultrasound for all four years. So we did a survey. We've always done surveys at the end of the PGY year one for our LCME results. Uh, uh, did you like your training? Did it prepare you? What would you do differently, et cetera? So we added some questions in 2010 uh, to rate the curriculum, and those are uh, scores out of five. Do you feel the ultrasound curriculum has been beneficial? And you can see 2010, 13, and 14, 89, 95, and 92. How have you used it? Um, and have used it physical diagnosis, assist procedures, confirmed diagnosis. Should ultrasound be a standard of medical education? And our last year was 97%. Now granted, our students are a little bit biased, <laughs> but um, very high. So what we did in 2013 and 14 was to send them some more questions about ultrasound and wanted to talk about match and we also sent it to their residency directors. Uh, so our uh, graduates um, in 3838 is about 42 percent response rate for, for ours. Um, do you think having ultrasound training gave you an advantage in residency match? The first year, 2013, the third said yes. This past year is up to 44 percent. Do you think having ultrasound training will be an advantage for future graduates? 70 up to 81 percent. Um, and then if you look at the residency directors, 
Um, do you think having our graduate come with ultrasound experience was a positive attribute for the residency? Two thirds said yes. Now this is across all residencies, uh, surgery, medicine, even psychiatry, in terms of how they viewed that skill of ultrasound. Do you think ultrasound will be an important skill for future residents? 70% in this past year, up to 76% said yes. Do you think having ultrasound will be an advantage for students in future matches? Two thirds and 13, about 50% in this one. Uh, now granted, a lot of these places don't have much ultrasound going on. So, you know, I think the more they learn, the more they're gonna realize this is gonna be a huge advantage. And I can tell you that folks like hospital directors, they'd love to have students come to be residents who have these skills uh, because you're going to increase patient safety and quality and all of those sorts of things by having them come on board. So what's going to really get a, a, a school nervous is that I don't want our students to be a disadvantage. I want them to have an advantage. Just some more areas, and you heard about some of these. Ultrasound crosses all these hot topics now, interprofessionalism, quality, evidence base, et cetera. Uh, so use those. You really want to use those to, to sell the program as well. One of the things you have to know, and I learned this from a senior staffer at a, a very successful politician's office a number of years ago. He said, you know, um, Senator so-and-so wants to know the benefits of what you're proposing, but also wants to know where the resistance is coming from and what the criticism is going to be. They have to know those. So we have to know those and we have to be prepared for those. Um, there's no place in an already crowded curriculum. Uh, students will not develop good physical exam skills. There's lack of proven educational value. We don't have enough faculty to teach it, uh, in inadequate resources to invest, just more technology between the physician and the patient. Um, not a good use of uh, students' time. When they get to residency, a lot of them won't have access to it, so you're wasting their time. Uh, what about credentialing, liability, billing, competition, all those sorts of things? These are things you have to be prepared because those are the questions that are going to come back at you. Um, some of these have no validity. Uh, so some of these do have validity, and we're trying to get answers for those as we end up moving forward. Some of, some of them simply will not change. It's the nature of education. Um, and when uh, Dave Boehner did the national survey of obstacles, two of the major obstacles were finances and no place in the curriculum. And so I don't know if you've seen this or not out of JAMA, the crowded medical curriculum. During the past year, one of the most important subjects of discussion has been the crowded medical curriculum. There's so many subjects in the curriculum of medical schools that it's difficult for students to get a clear idea of with regard to them. This overcrowding is becoming worse every year in spite of all that has been done. This was in 1909. Um, so this has been a problem that's been around for a very long time and it's probably not going to go away. So the real question has to be, what is the value that ultrasound is going to add to the curriculum? And if it's worth the time, then you put it in the curriculum. One of the things I feel very strongly about as well, you heard a lot about physical diagnosis. I don't think there's any question ultrasound enhances the accuracy of physical diagnosis, expands the physical diagnosis. But I can tell you there are many, many folks out there that are very anxious about students grabbing the probe and not learning the physical exam. Because they'll say, when they go out, they might not have um, ultrasound. And so you're doing a disservice. If they don't graduate with good physical exam skills, you've done a disservice. So one of the things we did last fall is we had two sections of our physical diagnosis group. Uh, we had physical, we had ultrasound as part of that. And we expanded the physical exam with it. We increased the accurate physical exam with it. But we also use ultrasound to enhance traditional physical exam skills because it's that immediate feedback where you can make that happen. This would be an example. So we're percussing the liver, trying to measure liver size. So then you actually take the pan and you mark it. Then you go ahead and use the ultrasound and you see the dimensions of it and say, gosh, I didn't get that down there. Let me percuss that again. So you use that immediate feedback to be able to do that and actually enhance their ability to percuss for the liver. Then we have a uh, fourth year medical student working with a second year medical student on uh, palpation. Uh, so uh, they're trying to feel the liver edge. So they've got their hand about right here with uh, liver up here and ask them to take a deep breath and down comes liver, touch the, touch the tip of the fingers. So holy cow, I feel it now. I, I really do feel it now. And so you can enhance their physical exam skills. You can do that with percussion of the lung. You can do that in a variety of ways. So I would encourage you when you do ultrasound physical diagnosis, also use it to enhance the physical, the traditional physical exam skills. 
Um, how are you going to pay for the program? I don't know if any of you guys ever tried this. I decided to shoot this slide, so I put that in there. And I copied it, and the machine cut off. And an uh, uh, error came up and said, what you're copying is illegal. <laughs> So I had to cut the machine off and cut it back on again. <laughs> and I, I told my administrative assistant, if the federal government shows up, tell them <laughs> I wasn't trying to make counterfeit money. So, okay, okay. Um, so um, we, need, we gotta figure out a way to, to sort of pay for the, the program. Uh, you've heard a lot of good points about this already. Again, we can go through this very quickly. Um, you, you're gonna talk to your dean or other leadership or uh, the hospital director, chief medical officer of the hospital. Be prepared. Know the mission of the school because whatever you propose better fit the mission of the school as well. So read up on what the mission of the school is. Always is good because there's primary care improve the health of the citizens of South Carolina. Well, that's what ultrasound's gonna do. Um, know your bullet points. We talked about earlier. Have some faculty support already committed. Don't go as an individual um, and say you're going to do this big, big program. You already need to rally that and get that team together for folks. So they, they know there's more than just one faculty member that's going to do this because one person simply can't do it, as you've heard. Um, you want to have a prior discussion with the Dean of Education. At some point, you have to get them on board. So um, find the friendly folks within the Office of Education and sort of um, work them around a little bit and get them to understand what it is you're trying to do. Um, have a plan to get started uh, because just, just like um, Zach was telling us about, uh, his mentor said, uh, you know, come with some answers. Uh, and so you have to have a plan. You want to have a plan that you can bring, and you also need some thoughts on sustainability. All of us that fund things, the question that's going to come up is, how are you going to keep this going? Yeah, I can give you some money to get it started, but how are you going to keep this going? Uh, have some sense of what will be needed and some support already in place. I was the associate dean when we started the program, and I had to convince the dean to invest. Um, so we developed a wonderful partnership with GE, and so I said, listen, we've got this great partnership with GE, so I've already got the machines covered, but I need some money for this, this, and this. So he said, okay. Um, so the name of the game is really leverage. Uh, you always want to try to leverage uh, whenever you, ever you can. Uh, you know, if something costs $50,000 and so-and-so is going to kick in 25, this other person say, well, I'll, I'll kick in 25 too. One person is not going to kick in 50. So always try to leverage whenever you can. Um, as talked about before, um, uh, have your ask ready, but don't ask for too much uh, because the question is going to be, well, how do you want to do this? How much is it going to cost to get started? So I have something prepared. Uh, well, I think we can probably get started with about 55000 um, An ultrasound demonstration would be great if you have time. There's no substitute for sitting in front of a machine um, and actually doing an ultrasound and have them do the ultrasound with you. Educational partnerships, there are many ways to look at this. Um, uh, as long as you follow your institution's conflict of interest policies, equipment contract policies, and your own um, internal moral compass, you'll, you'll be okay. Um, but, but please make sure you understand the institution. Uh, uh, you don't want to get either yourself or the institution in trouble right. with the university. You can have loans of equipment. You can have extended loads of equipment, more or less open-ended. Um, you can have special rates, um, purchase, lease, uh, lease to buy, package, bundle together. Give you an example of what we've done. Again, you can leverage. So you can cut a deal. You say, well, how about two for one? I say, well, okay, we can do two for one. So I go to the Simpson. I said, listen, I can get you a simulator and you a simulator. We both kick in half and we've got ourselves you know, two simulators. And they say, okay, let, let's do that. So we've done that and that's worked out very, very well. Um, Equipment for research, uh, lots of folks are more likely to fund research. One of the, one of the understandings that we have, we usually don't you know, put it in writing, one of the understandings we have when we do these um, grants is that, um, you know, we're going to do research. It's not just going to be published and the name's going to be out there as well. So that's one of the benefits that they can get as well. Boy, um, unfund, uh, unrestricted educational grants were great in the old day, um, but they're, they're hard to come by uh, these days. Um, but you can support CME activity, uh, faculty development, those sorts of things through uh, industry. Think very broadly. Don't just think ultrasounds machines. Think simulators. Uh, think review portals. Think education material. Think CME. Uh, we had a contract this past year with Prime Med. It does a lot of primary care CMEs and we did some workshops for them. It was good for them and it was good for us. Um, both parties can benefit. I don't think there's any question. If you think through this and sit down at the table, you can stay within legal uh, bounds. You can stay within the university's bounds and both of you can benefit. I like to show this. This is um, the Bay of Fundy, which is in Nova Scotia. It has the highest tide change anywhere in the world. Um, and look at the boats coming up. 
Ultrasound is a tide and all the boats will go up if we can get people to understand that. Uh, the manufacturers are going to benefit, the education people are going to benefit, uh, faculty are going to benefit, uh, but the greatest ben ben beneficiary is going to be the patients. Um, and so I think if we can get folks to understand that, maybe they can collaborate together a little bit more. Everybody's going to win. Uh, so all these boats are going to come up with the ultrasound tide. Grants, we've been real lucky with grants. Again, you want to think broad in terms of grants. Uh, we have a number of education grants, the patient quality grants, um, PCORI grants, uh, health care disparity grants, uh, uh, cost reduction, lots and lots of opportunities for grants. You need somebody who understands grants, though. Uh, you need, uh, the best thing to do is to go ahead and check with the university, check with the, the medical school and, and find out who, do, who handles the grants and get some, some advice. And if you can get a little bit of money to pay, to have part time for them to help you out, it'll go a long way as well. One of the things we try to do with all of our grants is we build in support for equipment, for faculty time, and develop educational material. So we got two of our machines that are paid by this grant, three of our machines that are paid by, by this grant, um, uh, 30 V scans that are paid by, by, by this grant. Uh, so we have partnerships, but we also are able to sort of build up our supply that, that way. Uh, so uh, al always think about how can I maximize this and it's again it's the rule of sustainability when there's little projects over am I going to have anything yeah I'm going to have education material and I'm going to have some um, uh, systems. So we got our first grant in 2007, uh, a training grant, then we got a pretty large Duke Endowment grant in 2008 to train primary care doctors in rural South Carolina. So we trained 12 practices in primary care and that was about a $675,000 grant that we got. Um, we got a grant for the free clinic. Uh, we didn't get much out of it. It basically paid for the machine for the free clinic. Sisters of Charity gave us money to do that. So now every time the faculty and students go to the free clinic, they got an ultrasound machine that they, they can uh, use and, and learn with and provide patient care. Uh, we got another grant then for um, primary care, um, handheld devices. Um, don't forget about the VA. The VA, VA now is really getting into ultrasound. Uh, some of the VAs, all, all VAs aren't the same, but some of the VAs. So if you have a VA attached to your uh, institution, I would uh, encourage you to get together with those folks because they're going to need the training that you can provide for them. Uh, develop an educational studio. We got another grant for that. Uh, one of the ones I'm really excited about is this last one, uh, Life Science Connections. Uh, we did that with the College of Education. It's 150,000, but I'm letting the College of Education keep most of it. So we're training 21 middle and high school science teachers to use ultrasound to teach biology, uh, living anatomy, et cetera. And it's really, really exciting sort of work, working with those folks um, because I think that's going to be one way that we give them a tool to improve education. But what I'm also hoping is it gets the kiddies excited about health professions as a, as a possibility. So our total funding since 2007 has been 1.8 million in educational grants. So this is just a shot from our rural South Carolina program. This is a shot for our handheld primary care. So the students use that on internal medicine, family medicine, and pediatrics. And you saw this a few minutes ago. I got a shot of all our V scans. Here are, we are at Airport High School. This was about a month ago. So we take students with us and we've got some science teachers there and we're teaching them to um, uh, uh, basically introduction so we're scanning the neck you know sometimes when we do these we have them scan each other didn't want to do this in this case though because it's a public situation um, and if you found something worrisome a thyroid nodule or something not a good idea so we had them scanning students and we also had them scanning us one student didn't show up so <laughs> um, I said go ahead start scanning me and I know I know everything looks relatively good in there um, so uh, so one of the things we're doing we have them three Saturdays then we'll have them for a full week in the summer uh, and we've got a, a great program set up uh, and the, the theme is you, you heard this morning about some of the projects here um, it's going to be built around a case and the case is star football athlete collapses and dies on the field um, and so then you break up into groups and they have these jigsaw things. I'm learning the terminology of the teaching of, of that level. And so you, you have an expert at each group. So you first you divide the areas. One area will be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, one will be Marfan's. Um, one will be, uh, when I wasn't even aware this could happen, you can take sickle trait. We certainly have a lot of sickle and stuff going on. You can take sickle trait and if you have exertional stress like dehydration and a lot of activity, you can actually go 
and derive the myelysis and die from that. Um, and then we're also going to just do uh, heat stress, uh, heat exhaustion as well. So we'll have four categories. One of the things they really wanted to work in was genetics because it's a big topic now. So we've got genetics covered in three out of the four. Uh, so th they break up into groups and, and then they develop expertise in each one of those. And you take one from each one of those and put it in another group and they develop a program. So we'll be teaching them um, plaques and how to uh, measure a uh, ventricular wall. Um, and then we'll have another exercise where they will um, uh, Basically, I haven't seen this done yet, so I can't explain it very well, but they take an egg and they do osmosis and they change uh, uh, the ion concentration and what goes through and what doesn't for like dehydration and understanding of that. Then you can also order the skeletal muscle for contraction. Uh, so we'll do all these that they will then go back and do in their, their labs as well. So it's really, really exciting. And I love working with the kiddies. Um, uh, at, at that age, they're really excited. So th this was from last week. We had a high school um, AP biology class come over, um, and they did some scanning. And all you have to do, again, um, capture pictures. All you have to do is look, look at the interest and excitement on, on this kid's face by actually seeing the heart there. And there's no way you can describe that in words. You have to see it. So development and donors. Uh, so uh, we've got grants, now we've got development and donors. Uh, we've had some luck here as well. Um, ultrasound is very, very attractive to donors. Uh, it's new, it's interesting, uh, they can visually get it. Uh, it's going to make a difference, um, and so um, we've had luck, and you will have some luck too. Uh, the key is to de develop a relationship with your development office. So invite the leadership of the development office over and let them find out about what you're doing. Do some ultrasound with them as well. And they say, this is neat stuff. Um, and so get, get to know them. You, ne you need to know people both within the medical school and the university. One of the really important points is and they have workshops on faculty development and training and stuff, and I would encourage you, if you haven't done that before, uh, to ask your chair or dean if you could, you could do that. The most important thing about donors is finding out what their passion is. So listen to them. When they walk in the door, don't start telling them all about ultrasound. Get to know them. What sort of things do they like? What, what sort of things are they interested in? How would they like to make a difference? Um, and, and then you, and the wheels are turning in terms of, well, if they're interested in global health, we'll put our global spin on it. If they're interested in kitties, we'll put our kitty spin on it. Um, it may be that they really don't have that much interest. It, it, what comes across is their passion for music. So you say, you know what? I've got some good friends in the School of Music. And then you start to trade, because development really is. Everybody wins if, if you do that. So I'm going to get you hooked up with so-and-so uh, in, in the music school. And that works out well. And, and they'll reciprocate uh, in terms of they got somebody who really wants to do something in, in medicine. Uh, so I, I would encourage you to take that approach. Also get background on your donors. Um, you know, my job and my assistant's job is when I have politicians, VIPs, CEOs, folks come through, we do a bio on them and we keep the bio on them and I scan through. And it's really interesting because you'll be sitting there talking to this. I saw what you taught a few years ago. You were taught, teaching middle, middle school and so-and-so. How did you know that? Um, and so it means that you took the time and energy to get to know them. Um, and so that, that connection is there. So I would encourage you to go ahead and do your homework on these folks. Create an informative presentation and tour for potential donors. Um, one, one of the tricks that we've used that has worked out incredibly well, it may be a politician, it may be board of trustees members that you have over, you go tell them about the program. They love meeting with students. Find students from their hometown. Immediate connection there when they end up coming in because they'll know people in the same town, they, they may went to the same high school, uh, and that connection is automatically there. So find good students who can really speak to ultrasound and that you can match up and you're from the same town. That works very, very well. Um, do a phantom model, um, uh, let them scan. Um, if you have a simulator, <laughs> um, uh, what I usually do with the simulator is I take the bones off uh, to make sure they can get a good image. And I had the president of the university, this was about, oh, maybe a couple years ago. And he came over and he was scanning. And of course, I gave him the general direction. We took all the bones off, so it's pretty easy to get a nice heart view. And I said, you're really good at this. He said, yeah, I'm really good at this. So, um, uh, so make it easy for them when, when they come to do that. The same thing is true with the phantom models. I tell you, we've convinced a lot of folks over the years in terms of <clears throat> you do your spiel, you do your demonstration, and they like that. They say, this is neat. <clears throat> Then you put that phantom on there, and they watch that needle go into that vessel. Invariably, the next question is, 
when is my doctor getting one of these? They get it. They immediately get it. So, you know, make, make sure they have that sort of experience uh, where they understand the possibilities. And again, take plenty of pictures. Um, I, I have to tell you, um, if, if you can um, get your institution to designate an ultrasound institute or a center of excellence, it helps tremendously. And then if you can go a step further and have bricks and mortar, it even goes further. Because when people donate, when they commit, they want to know how long this is going to go on. So physical structure reassures them. The, the school, the university is committed, and it's going to go on for a good long while. Uh, so try to get that if you can. Um, it also gives you naming opportunities. Um, be careful, though. You need to check with your university and your school. You can't just go around naming things um, because they, they're not happy with that. <laughs> well, we have a center of so-and-so. Where did that come from? Uh, so make, make sure you check and see what the policy is. It usually means the Board of Trustees has a sign-off on it. Um, develop a standardized tour. It can be modified for your visitors. Create a Friends of the Institute um, newsletter so to keep them posted, keep connected as well, keep money coming in. So um, our first uh, donor gave us $100,000 to do some renovation because we wanted to create uh, the studio, I mean, the uh, institute. Um, then we got an endowed uh, professorship in ultrasound, and it happened to be a former nurse who um, used to work a lot with the kiddies. And then we started talking about, you know, ultrasound is really great, great for the kiddies. And you use the example of the poor kiddies on the um, oncology service and how they have to get so many sticks and how this can decrease the number of sticks and so much easier. She was ready to sign. Um, and so, you know, to get to know them and then how, how can this make their lives better? Um, Global ultrasound. Uh, we've got a, uh, we've got an alumnus who uh, does um, a lot of global work, um, and so that's the pitch we made with her. Um, and so she actually uh, gave us seventy five thousand to take a machine. We got a uh, machine at, ho at um, Hospital Albert Schweitzer in Central Haiti that they still have. It's been about seven years now, uh, and she's continued to help with uh, global programs. Primary care, uh, hundred thousand. Um, one of the things that we've done, and you'll have to figure out how to do this. Almost all medical schools and universities have annual giving drives. Um, and so what you do is you give your money and you can designate where you want your money to go. If you can get ultrasound program on there, that'll be money coming in as well. Um, so, and this is where you get that feedback from students and all, and they love the program. Um, they'll say, oh yeah, and alumni say, yeah, this, this is a great idea. So they'll designate it to come to you. I don't like other people getting in the way of the money because sometimes it doesn't get there. Uh, so here's our lobby for our institute. Uh, here's our... Um, Demonstration lecture hall. Here's me making a pitch to a donor. Here's a nephrologist whose son was a medical student. Of course, he went straight for the kidney. Um, but you'll notice in this picture, um, he um, gave us money to renovate one of the, the labs, the hands-on scanning labs. And there's a plaque behind them. We had an uh, event, and they came over, and we had students and everybody come over. So he gave us money to renovate that. So we put a plaque up. So when you have these rooms, you can take almost every one of those rooms and get a donor for it. Uh, so that can help you with the brick and mortar as well. And then I mentioned to make sure you do the phantom scans. And here's a plaque's view. Pretty good image done by eighth graders. Um, so we have this program in the, in the summer as part of the university and you want to have good relations with the university. It's called uh, Adventures um, in uh, Medicine Scholars. So they spend a week with us. And not only do they learn how to do good views, they can name you all the anatomy in those views as well. And of course, their parents were the kind of parents that, that really are concerned about the education and the future of their kids. So most of them are pretty well off as well. So we establish relationships with the parents and they say, hey, this is great. Well, I want to keep this program going. So we do a, a lot, lot of stuff with, with the kids. Two weeks ago, uh, two Saturdays ago, we had a Girl Scout event. We had everybody from the Brownies on through to the seniors, um, and some of them actually scanned, some demonstrated. Um, uh, we, we had this uh, uh, sort of um, T 
team event at the end, and it would be a, a, a standardized patient lying on the ground outside, and one of the brownies would have to call um, 911 and explain to them what was going on, and then we taught a fast exam to the seniors, and they would do a fast exam, um, and they had a grand time doing that. But a uh, uh, great way to um, get in with the community and, and really be part of the, the community. We have a program called GEMS, Girls Exploring Medicine and Science, that we, that we do. Um, you know, not only we're we talking about, because we, we, we were hearing about uh, ultrasound's going to happen. There's just no question about it. Um, I think the key is it should be just natural. It, it, people should use it in science. They should understand it. Um, and then a lot of the, the little stuff that we do, we don't have to bother with. They'll come with a skill set with us already. And also for donors, uh, I, I, I learned, learned this trick a number of years ago. There was a development officer. She'd been around a long time. She said, if you have a project, if somehow you can get children and kids in that project. For example, Children's Hospital for Adults. And so <laughs> you can um, get children in the name somehow, and then they'll give money. Uh, so we, we, work, we work a lot with, with, the, with the kiddies. Now, our youngest learner is this one. Uh, that's my grandson, Luca. And he's looking at his heart. Uh, and so, you know, we, we got a great picture of him. Look at, he, he turned two years old yesterday. And uh, so um, lots and lots of opportunity to work with the kitties. So what's happening is, um, how many people in here have uh, scanned their kitties or, or had their children do some scanning? We've had some folks. Well, you know what's happening? We're creating the scan generation. Um, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, one of the things I hear concern about, though, is that this is not a toy. This is serious stuff that we're doing. And yes, it is uh, serious stuff that we're doing. And that's why it's our responsibility to make sure it's done right. Uh, and that's what we're all about doing. Uh, so if, if we can sort of work with those people and give them the right introduction and a true understanding and see. But the, these kids are going to be coming uh, with uh, you know, tremendous skill level already. So what about CME, another revenue stream? This can be a very, very good revenue stream. You get your program up and running, you can offer CME courses uh, on your campus locally and regionally. Lots and lots of advantages uh, to that. Uh, you can offer discounts to alumni and friends of the School of Medicine. I mean, you're already putting a program on, so you uh, take a few slots and you say, you know, why don't you come on down? Uh, uh, call folks up that uh, um, uh, can be potential bigger friends of the school. Um, can increase referrals uh, because now they get to know the people in the school and they start sending folks to your practice plan, so that can be beneficial. Um, reserve spots for faculty and residents. You know, when we talk about faculty development, hey, you train these folks, we'll save a couple of them. So when we have CME, we'll call over to the residency and say, listen, we got some spots. Uh, you got some residents you want to send over for our two day course, so we'd be happy to have them, uh, no cost at all. Um, CME can provide that steady revenue stream, and it, it is a service to the community. Uh, one of the things that we started doing as well is that um, we have some contracts now. So family medicine rural programs, we've contracted to, to teach their residents over time. We don't make a lot of money off of it, but we make a little bit of money and certainly pay our way um, and it establishes relationships with them. So CME is an opportunity. Patents, licenses, the world we live in now, universities and medical schools, innovation, entrepreneurship, public-private collaboration, highly encouraged, highly encouraged to do that. You usually have an office of intellectual property. We also have an office of technology commercialization, and they just throw in commercialization because that's what it's all about. Um, and uh, lots of opportunities in ultrasound, technology, simulation, phantoms, education material, clinical applications, etc. And I don't, don't, don't have my sound. Um, Chris, do you know how I might get my sound? Yeah. Um, it, what I want to do is, um, about three years ago, we took an old stethoscope and we uh, slid the stethoscope, uh, slide, slid a lavalier mic down into it. So we did simultaneous recordings of um, the echo with the heart sounds. So, so what you see here is um, closure of S1, closure of S2, and if you listen closely, and sometimes you have to close your eyes, you'll hear aortic insufficiency. And then you put the Doppler on that, and you see the aortic insufficiency. Um, so we have a couple of exercises for the students. One exercise we do when they're learning the heart is, is we go ahead and have one student capture the echo and one's listening, and then they reverse. And then we also made a, um, 
PowerPoint with a number of these, aortic stenosis, et cetera. And I, we don't have the data yet, but the students say anyway, it enhances their ability to auscultate. Uh, so here again, we're using ultrasound to improve their ability to do classic traditional exam. You can do the same thing with lung. So you see a few beelines uh, flowing across there with respirations, uh, and you hear the crackles of um, this is a peer, uh, patient with severe um, sarcoid. Gosh, I never heard that before. Yeah, you can see it and you can hear it at the same time. So this is the way we used to do it. We still do it this way. So we're doing recording. And so now we have a patent, we have a utility patent where we've designed to put a microphone pickup within the probe itself. Um, and so we've gone proof provisional and now we're up to utility patent with that. So this, this next one, the uh, waters get a little bit choppy here. Billing by non-traditional users. Um, and so it's an issue that has to be addressed. It has a potential for revenue. Um, you need to educate people on what we're doing with POCUS. Um, timing is critical. You need leadership support. Um, in most places, I, you need, need to know the politics. I would start off by doing quality studies with no billing, um, or if you want to do billing with guided procedures, that's probably okay. Hard to, it's hard to argue against patient safety, quality, and education. Collect data, because our job right now is to collect data in terms of avoiding complications, decreasing length of stay, fewer readmissions going to affect bottom line, so everybody wants that data. Um, and uh, Dave Tierney at um, Abbott uh, in Minnesota has got some great data he's collecting now. All of these things are going to be important when we start looking at quality and bundle payments and those sorts of things. Ultimately, we're going to have to find a system that's fair and equitable for everybody. Governmental support, state, local, national, um, lots of um, grants out there, many of them you're probably not even aware of. Our um, grant that we had for our training rule, South Carolina docs now has been picked up by the state, uh, so we continue to get support for that. Uh, form partnerships. Um, and what's good about this too is you get these folks in here and you participate with them. So this is our senior Congressman Clyburn. He has a health fair and people are coming back to our screening in the back. We take students with us to do education. He came by um, and worked as well. So it creates good relationship, not just for the School of Medicine, but for the university. And you want university support. You want partnerships. I mentioned uh, School of Education, but we have partnerships with public health, nursing, engineering. Really, really important for that because the more integrated you are into the university and there's somebody that needs you, there, don't you mess with ultrasound now. We've got a project going on with them. So the, the, the more support you have across the university, the better off you're going to be. University leadership times sometimes make decisions on donors, um, and so you know you want to make sure you get somebody speaking up for you. I put this last because it's one of the things that makes me uh, a little bit nervous, and I would caution you, but I think we can justify it. You can make an argument for uh, a fee for students. We have IT fees, library fees, anatomy fees. Um, there's just not enough data, not enough support yet for them to say, with the debt so high of medical students, you bring up the notion of a student fee and nobody's happy. Um, but um, I think at some point this argument can be made uh, and very quietly we're talking to the right people. I think you can probably do that. So in conclusion, these truly are wonderful, exciting times to be in medical education. Ultrasound has the potential to fundamentally change how we teach and practice medicine for the benefit of learners and patients across the globe. You are part of the change, and you'll improve the lives of many individuals for decades to come. The financial challenge is considerable, but, cannot, but can be overcome. Years from now, no one will remember the financial struggles because those will fade in the knowledge that our profession made a culture change to train healthcare practitioners with the technology that improved the lives of all of their patients at the bedside where medicine is best taught and practiced. And a final Homer slide. The serenity and peace that comes with knowing you have contributed to making the world a better place. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Number one, I can't type nearly fast enough to take down all your immense information. It's really fantastic. Are your slides available? Yes, yes. Uh, in, in fact, uh, that's why this is here. We're recording it as, as we speak, and hopefully we'll be posted in the next day or two. <laughs> okay. I, I have a, uh, a question. You, you mentioned something that you didn't cover, um, but you had a lot of times when you brought the machines off campus. You mentioned something you didn't cover. That didn't make no sense. You brought the machines off campus a lot. 
how do you deal with something that might happen to the machine when it's off campus? Does your university have a policy? Um, uh, we, we have all, all of our equipment insured, yeah. Um, and, in fact, you know, with our students, uh, knock on wood, we haven't had many problems, but our students have had uh, B-Scan stolen, but we have insurance on it, so they're replaced. Uh, so, yeah, we, we have insurance for, uh, for our equipment. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. <laughs> um, so the invention you're thinking of having the, with the uh, microphone embedded into the uh, probe, so, and I don't, I don't know enough about the probes to know the resolution of this, but the, uh, the sunset that I have, you, uh, you can take uh, a scan and it has sound as well. So now, now, now th 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 these are real these are real patients that we're doing, and we're picking up the heart and uh, and getting the image at the same time. Right, but my sonosite will do that. I just well, I haven't used it. I don't know enough to do echo on it. Um, it's, it's not yeah, when you're when you're saying the doctor, you can oh, yeah, probe yeah, and then you can auscultate. Yeah, yeah. I, what we're talking about is the same sound that you would get as you as if you were listening through a stethoscope uh, with. Uh, uh, S1, S2, S3, murmurs, etc. I, I, I haven't seen that. I don't know if you, if you guys have seen it. Yeah, you, 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 you can hear sound. Yeah. yeah. The flow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but, but those aren't those aren't really the murmur sounds. The the, clo the closing of the valves. Those aren't valves. That's just blood flow. Yeah. Good, but I would have to probe. You can you can isolate the sound. You can bring it right over the valve. Ele electric scope? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. It doesn't really work as well as what we often does. I mean, you can do it with a little bit more length, um, but that's an other um, option. The blue team concept works well. But, but, but it does use Bluetooth, and so, right. so you can go ahead and merge them together. Yeah. Okay, yes? Uh, how do you, uh, you talked about getting funding for getting faculty on board or getting new people on board. How do you keep that going after the initial bit of funding? I mean, where does the money come from? Well, you know, I think that's why you need to think sustainability. So, for example, we now have primary care fellowships. We, we, we followed the lead of emergency medicine. So um, I had two primary care fellows last year, one a hospitalist and one a generalist. Um, so they help us with CME. Um, they're part of contracts. Uh, they do all those things as well. So that's certainly one way, and they could generate revenue. What I try to get them to do is to get the bulk of their salary through their hospital practice. So the hospitalist is 70% hospitalist and 30% fellow. Uh, so we do it like that. Okay. Yes. What kind of fees are you charging for family, family practice um, part of their um, You mean the, the big contract or just the CME? Um, it, it, it depends. Um, a lot of it depends on the relationship that we have that with the uh, family medicine program. Um, we're going into our third one now, um, and so what we try to do, we're not trying to make money uh, off, off those folks. So, what, what's kind of a reasonable um, It would depend on how long. We just finished one for three years, so that was a long contract. Some of them just want six months. The number of sessions, what we'll do is break it down to the number of sessions and all sorts of things. If you'd like to talk about it, I'd be happy to talk about it. Okay, good. All right, thanks so much, guys.